Why I Quit Delivering Food by Michael Squid. I've been Dash delivering for a few months now and enjoy the freedom of not having a boss order me around. I can play whatever music I want in my car and take jobs I want and skip the ones that tip poorly. I'm not saving much due to the gas costs, but I am saving and I was enjoying seeing new places and meeting new people. That changed after I received a notification for a $150 paying delivery. Immediately I swiped accept and then pulled over to read it. I first expected this to be some out of state delivery to some rich individual longing for some Michelin rated specialty. I regretted not checking the distance first, but still very much worth the easy $150. I sighed with relief and pressed the GPS button to bring up the map to a restaurant named Danny's that I had not previously heard of. The sun was setting early, as it does in October, and I had my lights on by the time I made it to a less populated corner of town where the restaurant was apparently located. Dinner brings the best tips, but I hate driving at night since it's harder to find restaurants without a boldly emblazoned logo lit up in neon. That, and I've always harbored some lurking fear of a delivery churn mugging, or worse, some gang-initiated killing. Rare as it is, it has happened. You have arrived at your destination. The soothing voice of the GPS alerted me. I slowed to a stop, confused. I was on a dark residential street, no sign of a restaurant in sight. Where Danny's was supposed to be was a dark gap in between two homes. I checked it again, even typing the restaurant name into maps outside of the delivery app, but nothing popped up. I realized then it might have been a glitch. $150 for 30 minute delivery sounded too good to be true. I sighed and began searching the app for the troubleshooting menu when a loud slap on my passenger side window caused me to jump in my skin. A man stood outside my car, his hand pressed against the pane. I rolled down the window, only a crack, just enough to hear him. You the delivery driver? He asked, and my mouth went dry. I didn't want to say yes because the vision of a pistol pulled and a muzzle flash kept playing in my mind. But he seemed harmless enough. Older too. Mid-fifties, receding hairline, thin frame. Not quite the gang initiation type. I was fairly certain everyone knew that delivery drivers nowadays don't carry cash. Yeah, I'm looking for a Danny's restaurant. Is it near here? The man just looked at me with a hollow stare before raising his other hand. The fear of an impending bolt to the brain immediately dissipated when I saw a large plastic bag. I sighed out in relief and lowered the window, accepting the delivery. It was large, much larger than I was used to delivering. I typically receive a styrofoam container or two, a drink as well. The plastic bag contained a stapled paper one, filled out nearly to the top. I needed to use both hands to accept it. I placed a surprisingly heavy meal in the passenger seat staring at it for a moment before looking up again. Thank you. My words tapered off as I realized the man was already a few yards back. I watched him disappear in the shadow-filled gap between houses. I have no idea where he was going or where he had come from. Dark curiosity led me back to the app to see what I was even delivering. My confusion only heightened when I saw the order. Danny's, it simply said where cheeseburger, fries, and the like would typically be listed for me to check off upon pickup. Despite the questions that kept tugging at my resolve, $150 for this awkward delivery was the overpowering factor. I swiped the slide after pickup button bar to continue the delivery. My insides squirmed a bit at the revelation. The delivery address seemed to be dead in the middle of the woods. I shifted into drive and followed the directions onto the highway. The sun had fully set, but the tunes from the radio kept me in good spirits. Few people were on the road, so I was making great time and could call it an early night after this gig. The miles counted down from 15 to 10 to five. The off-ramp came into view and the large pine trees on either side of the highway continued to darken the path as I merged onto smaller roads. With every mile further into the wilderness, my uneasiness grew. More than a few times, my eyes darted over to the suspicious double bag delivery on my seat. My heart raced as my mind played tricks on me in the shrouding darkness of the tall trees on either side. I did a double take when I thought I saw the bag rustle. Something within appeared to have moved. 
the last turn on the GPS signaled for me to take a left. It was a turn off the paved asphalt road and onto a dirt road that cut into the woods. I slowed to a stop and double checked the app, praying there was some sort of mistake. On occasion, the wrong address was listed. No luck, however. My destination was a half mile into the dense wall of pines. I took the turn and slowly drove into the dark tunnel cutting through the arching trees. I could barely see the sky through the dense clouds overhead, just darkness broken up by the limb-like branches. With each rocking of the chassis and each bump in the narrow dirt road, that heavy bag on the passenger seat seemed to rustle. I fixed my eyes on the road, deciding not to look at it after I began to hear a faint noise emitting from the stapled dinner bag, a noise that sounded like a faint wheezing. By the time I arrived at the destination, my knuckles were white from gripping the wheel so hard. I was sweating, despite the autumnal chill that had breached my car and clothing. This part of the woods seemed colder than any part of the drive by at least 10 degrees. I shifted into park and looked at the app screen, the only source of light aside from my headlights, which faded only a few meters out. The address was supposedly on the left, and the instructions read, leave at door. There was no house in sight, however. It had to be a glitch of sorts. Above all else, I didn't want to leave the safety of my vehicle. This entire delivery had been all wrong. Something dreadful about it made me crave a shower. It made me want to run screaming from the situation I had unknowingly gotten myself into. I saw the bag shift in my peripheral vision, and I let out a glottal yelp. I hurriedly opened the car door and got out, eager to distance myself with whatever was in the bag. I then navigated the menu app on my phone screen, seeking out the cancel order option. My score would go down, I'd miss out on the money, but I'd be able to get out of this strange gig that I wanted nothing more to do with. I was about to press confirm on the cancellation when I spotted the door. It looked ancient, its thick wooden beams bone white from petrification. The design was archaic, something that belonged on the side of a medieval European church. Black steel hinges and latches ornamented it, but the most noticeable feature was the one it was missing. The door was housed in a frame of charred black beams, but aside from that, it wasn't attached to anything. I stared at the structure and felt my heartbeat quicken. Dread and curiosity battled within my screaming mind as I tried to register what this door was and why it was out there. I took a few hesitant steps towards it and felt the hairs of my body rise. With every step towards the detached door, the temperature dropped. I stepped around the unnatural thing to peer behind it, and sure enough, there was nothing behind but endless trunks of trees. I'd made it this far, and I just wanted to get my money and get out. With a few deep breaths, I returned to my car and opened the passenger door. With two hands, I lifted the heavy delivery, which shook in my shivering arms. It moved. Something gasped and gurgled from within, but I continued carrying the parcel over to that strange door. My teeth chattered from the chill as I placed a large bag on the dead leaves in front of the door. I took a photo to verify the delivery, then swiped to complete it. And with that, I rushed back to my car and got inside as quickly as possible. I then heard the faint cries of an infant. I saw the bag shift and shake, poked outward from the inside. I shifted into reverse and began to backtrack down the pitch black road into the heart of the woods. Not before I saw that rotted black arm with long desiccated fingers reach out eagerly. I watched it yank that screaming delivery bag into the impossible space behind the door that should not exist. It was summer in small town New Mexico. I was about 15 years old at the time, and since school was out, I was doing a few odd jobs around town to earn some money. Mowing lawns, walking dogs, anything that could make me a few bucks, you know. There was this one guy who lived in my town, an older gentleman in his early 70s, Mr. Lesnar. He used to be a teacher at my school, but I hadn't seen him for at least a year. 
He was bald, with a big white beard. Put a red suit on the guy and he could have passed as a mall Santa. I always remembered him as being a nice, friendly guy, so when I bumped into him in town, I asked if there was anything he needed help with. He said there was. He needed help reorganizing a few parts of his house, said that he'd pay me 50 bucks if I helped him. When you're 15 years old, having $50 in your pocket feels like being a millionaire. I took him up on it. The next day rolled around, and I went over to Mr. Lesnar's house and knocked on the door. He answered with a smile on his face and invited me inside. First thing that struck me was the stench. His house had that old person smell about it. I didn't know much about the guy to be honest. I mean, yeah, he used to teach at my school, but all I really remembered about him was how he always wore socks with sandals, and how he always spent every school vacation down in Mexico. I started off by cleaning up in the kitchen. Once I'd finished, Mr. Lesnar told me that he wanted help boxing up some things in the basement. Said he had too much junk down there, and that he wanted to reorganize and get rid of a load of it. Told me to start boxing things up, and to come and tell him when I'd finished. There must have been a set of twelve stairs that led down into this strangely large, stale-smelling basement. Mr. Lesnar flicked the light switch. A lone, dusty light bulb illuminated the basement. I grabbed a few folded up cardboard boxes and made my way down. So, there I was, just boxing all sorts of things up in this grungy basement. Must have spent about 45 minutes down there by myself. While I was working, I happened to lean against a particular spot on the wall. When I leant on it, I came across something odd. A loose panel in the basement wall. Not a broken part of the wall, mind you. I mean, this panel was intentionally loose. Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I started fumbling with it. It came right off. Behind the panel was a small compartment. Hidden inside that compartment was a box. It felt like finding a hidden treasure chest. I checked to see if Mr. Lesnar was standing behind me at the top of the stairs. The coast was clear. I knew I probably shouldn't, but I pulled out the box. I lifted off the top, curious to see what the old man was hiding inside. At first, it didn't look like there was much in it. A journal, a few knickknacks, and a small pile of photographs maybe 10 or 12 in total. I took out the photos. My heart immediately sank after looking at the top one. At first I could hardly believe the image. It showed Mr. Lesnar with a pistol in his hand, kneeling down next to a dead woman lying in the dirt. Her lifeless eyes were staring into the camera lens. She was clearly Mexican and had obviously been shot. The second photo was almost identical, only this time it was a male who stared lifelessly at the camera. No, no, this can't be real, I thought. I flicked through all the pictures, every damn one, each one telling the same story. They all showed Lesnar, knelt down next to some bloody, human game, sprawled out on the ground in front of him. All of the victims varied wildly in age. I was writing on the backs of all the photos, but it was all in Spanish, and I couldn't make it out. Still, I knew instantly what this was. A box full of sick mementos from Lesnar's trips to Mexico, hidden away from the world in a small wall compartment. In some photos, Lesnar looked younger. In others, he appeared to be in his mid-sixties. In all of them, he was kneeling down next to his victims, with the same disturbing grin on his face posing like a hunter with his trophies. I was overcome by this weird mixture of shock, disgust, anger, and most of all, fear. Fear that I was in the basement of the monster in these photos. Without thinking, I shoved the images back inside the box and slid the container back into the wall. I desperately fumbled with the wall panel, trying to put it back in the exact same way it was, not wanting the old man to realize that I'd discovered his horrible secret. I had just about got the damn thing back in place when I heard a creaking at the top of the basement stairs behind me. I turned to see old man Lesnar standing by the basement door, looking down at me. I have never felt more like a rat in a cage. Looks like you're doing a good job, he said. 
My heart skipped a beat. I just mumbled something and tried to act like nothing was wrong. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just going upstairs for a nap. You keep on going down there. With that, he slowly turned and walked off through the hallway. There was maybe twenty seconds of silence before I heard his footsteps making their way up the stairs to his bedroom. My mind was racing. Had he seen me fiddling with the panel? Did he know that I'd found his photos? Oh god, was I in danger? I was only a scrawny kid. I decided not to stay down there wondering. I waited for a few moments before bolting up the basement staircase. I dashed towards the front door, grabbed the handle and twisted. No good. The damn thing had been locked from the inside. I figured the old man had just locked it before he went upstairs. I scanned the door to see if there was a way to quickly open it. No time. I could hear movements above me. The old man was walking back out of his bedroom and towards the stairs. I sprinted through the hallway and into the kitchen. I knew from the cleaning earlier there was a back door there. I grabbed the handle and prayed. With a twist, it flung open. It felt like winning the lottery. I flew out of that house, ran around the property and back onto the main street. I looked back only once. When I did, I saw the old man's face in one of the downstairs windows. He looked to be holding something. I was too far away to make out what it was exactly, but I bet you can guess what I thought it was. From there, I kept on running until I got home, thankful that the old man lived in a cul-de-sac and not in the middle of nowhere. If he did, I'm certain he'd have taken a shot at me. It goes without saying that I told my parents what I'd found. We notified the authorities about it, and I told them about the secret panel and the sick mementos in the box. When they checked the place out, they did indeed find the secret compartment. Predictably, it was totally empty. There was no box hidden inside, no evidence of any wrongdoing whatsoever. They figured I was just messing with the old guy or something, and decided not to look into him any further. I don't know what Lesnar did with the pictures, whether he destroyed them or hid them elsewhere, but he got away with it all regardless. Old man Lesnar lived another eight years after that. In that time, I graduated high school, went off to college, and moved out of town. My parents always lived in that same place, however. For all the time I lived there after that incident, and whenever I'd go back to visit my parents, I'd always be looking over my shoulder. I knew that Mr. Lesnar wanted to take his secret to the grave, and I always worried that he'd try and silence me to do so. It's hard to believe there are people like this, who, to the outside world, are leading seemingly ordinary lives. I'm glad I didn't become his last trophy. A few years ago now, when my wife was pregnant with our first daughter, she was browsing Craigslist when she came across some maternity clothes for a cheap price. She sent an email to the seller, who went by the name of Jenny, and they agreed to meet at Jenny's place to do the exchange. We were supposed to go and pick up the clothes together, but on the day of the deal, my wife was suffering with some extreme morning sickness. She sent me out to pick up the clothes, and me, not being a complete idiot, asked my pal Big Bernie to come along with me. He's six foot four, hence the nickname. I wasn't expecting trouble, but two safer than one, and you can never be too careful. Bernie agrees, and even offers to drive us down in his truck, on the condition that I pay for the gas and a six pack of beer. We hit the road at around midday, and it should only be a thirty minute drive. We joke around, sing along to the radio, and discuss future plans. A few minutes from the end of the journey, I notice that the closer we're getting to our destination, the further we're getting from civilization. The turning to the place is coming up on the left, and it's an old run-down farmhouse in essentially the middle of nowhere. Nothing but dirt and brush in either direction for at least half a mile. And even then, the closest buildings are other run-down farmhouses too. Some people would call it horribly isolated, and others would call it paradise. At that moment, we thought it was ominous. As we pull into what I hasten to call a driveway, we both question whether this is really the right house. 
Bernie double checks on the map to confirm. Sure enough, this is the woman's house. We're not too worried though, since it's still daylight and there are two of us. We exit the vehicle. We're greeted by some heavyset dude who was waiting on the porch, and he introduces himself as the man of the house. Immediately, I can tell there's something bothering him. He asks me where my wife is, and I tell him that she couldn't make it. He motions for us to come inside, saying that his wife has the clothes ready for us to pick up. My warning signals are starting to blink as we approach the house. This doesn't seem like the sort of place that even has a phone, let alone internet connection to post a Craigslist ad. As we step inside, there's a room off the hallway with some commotion going on inside. Standing in a room completely void of any furniture are about seven other burly men, just standing around in a sort of semicircle. Now, this is creepy as all hell. What the fuck would all these greasy guys be doing with a bunch of clothes for a pregnant woman? They all turn to look at us as we poke our heads in, all with the same expression on their face. Disappointment. They weren't hillbillies exactly, but they were of a similar breed. Put it this way, you could tell just by looking at them that they were trouble. Every fiber of my being is screaming that we need to get the fuck out of there right away. But social etiquette is a hell of a powerful thing. So when the main guy said to follow him into the kitchen for the clothes, we did. He led us into a decrepit kitchen, again completely empty other than a few broken down appliances. You got the money? I reply with a yes, but I'm hesitant to get my wallet out in front of this guy. He picks up some dirty rag and extends it out to me. Like this is the thing I'm supposed to be buying. Um, no. That's not what we came here for. He stares at me, with some creepy, excited looking smile on his face. And it becomes obvious that there were never any clothes for sale in the first place. Unsure of how to respond, Bernie takes control and says, Yeah, hold on. We'll go and get the money. An obvious lie, but good enough that this guy doesn't question us. Instead, he just stands there, with that same damn expression plastered across his ugly face. As we exit the farmhouse, we can see that all of the men who were in the other room are now leaning against Bernie's truck. Some of them are even rummaging through the things he keeps on the back. Now we know for sure that these guys aren't gonna let us go without a fight. Fuck. We're slowly walking back towards the truck, and I'm hoping to God that Bernie's got a plan. He's thinking the same thing I am, and without words, we give each other that universal look of shit. My memory of all of this comes back to me in slow motion. Bernie whispers for me to stay cool, and approaches the guys who are rummaging through the truck. We're outnumbered. And for all we know, outgunned. So, rather than confront these hillbilly wannabe bastards, Bernie instead tells them about the power tools on the back seat. They start crowding around and digging about back there, proving just the distraction we needed. We both fucking dart into the nearby tree line. Forget the van, forget the tools. We just have to get the hell out of there and away from these creeps. We keep going until we think they're a good distance behind us, and then we lay low for a while, desperately searching for cell phone signal. After a while in the woods, we hear people approaching, and we take cover in the thicket. Bernie arms himself with a rock from the ground, and I follow suit. We're both praying that this isn't the cast of deliverance descending upon us, but rather some decent folk who just so happen to be out for a walk or something. But as we hear their screeching and hollering, that illusion is shattered. We can't tell how many of them have chased us out this far, but it's clearly them. And what's worse, what really made my blood curdle with unprecedented fear was the sound of something else that got louder as they got closer. The sound of Bernie's fucking DeWalt power drill buzzing. One of those battery-powered ones. 
Now my imagination's kicked into overdrive with what might happen if they catch us, and all we've got to fight them off with is a couple of rocks. We remain silent long after these guys pass us by, just to make sure they were long gone. Eventually, we found a signal and called the police, who take their sweet-ass time to get to the location. When they finally do arrive, the place was empty. All of their vehicles were gone, as were all of Bernie's tools inside of the van, which had taken a beating as well. It still ran, though, so we were able to get back home. Thankfully, Bernie kept his hands on the keys. Turns out, that building really was abandoned, and not one of those guys lived there. We never heard anything else about it from the cops. What I think is really messed up is that these guys lured us out there with the promise of maternity clothes, meaning that they intentionally wanted their victims to be a couple of prospective parents. I'm thankful every day that my wife didn't come with me. Her pregnant self wouldn't have been able to get away quick enough, and we would have been at the mercy of those guys. There's no way I could have fought them off. Hell, I couldn't even with Big Bernie on my side. My daughter was born shortly after this incident, healthy and beautiful, and thankfully, she won't have to grow up without her father. The sound of power drills still brings back those memories. When I was about 12, I was walking home from school with friends. Like usual, after we got to the main road, I was on my own, because I lived farther away than the other kids. One day I noticed that a little white pickup truck had passed me quite a few times, but being the naive little girl that I was, I assumed that they were merely lost. I realized that the pickup seemed to be following me when it turned onto my neighborhood, at which point I ran as fast as I could to get to my house. Again, I wasn't certain that the truck was following me, so I kind of brushed it off. I considered myself safe once inside my house. I went about my usual after-school routine, kicked off my shoes, turned on the TV, grabbed a snack out of the fridge, and let my two dogs in from the outside. As I'm about to sit down and enjoy my snack, I hear a car door slam. I run over to the blinds, and sure enough, I see the little white truck sitting in my driveway. A few seconds later, there was a knock at my door, and me being the stupid kid that I was, answered it for whatever reason. I opened the door and saw the man that was driving earlier in the pickup truck. He was sweaty and just stared into my eyes. I asked him what he wanted, but he didn't say anything. It was one of the most awkward moments of my life, and I remember the encounter so vividly. I was just about to ask him again when he suddenly tried to force his way into my house. I slammed the door as hard and as fast as I could and somehow managed to lock it as well. My two trusty beagles started to bark. He bangs on the front door for a few minutes and then proceeds to the backyard where he starts to bang on the back door. What did this guy want? I crawled my way to the kitchen because that's where our landline was. I called my grandpa who lived down the street because I figured he could get to me faster than the police could. My grandpa told me he would be at my house in less than five minutes and to call the police after I hung up. At this point, I started to scream and beg the man banging on my door not to kill me as I cried hysterically. But no. He was hitting heavily on the door, harder and harder. That's when I really started to get scared for my life. So I decided to go hide somewhere upstairs. Running upstairs, I noticed the banging stop. So I go back over to the blinds and see that the pickup is gone. My grandpa showed up a few seconds later. I run over to him and tell him that the man left right before he got there. As I'm telling my grandpa all of this, I see the truck pass by my street as it headed towards the neighborhood entrance. I try to point it out, but I'm guessing I wasn't making much sense because he just pushed me back towards my house. There was no sign of the guy, other than him leaving the garden gate open and a picture that I took from our security camera footage. I never ended up calling the cops, although I should have. From that day on, I had to go to my grandpa's house after school every day for a few months. Though we talked about the incident with my family, I never really heard about or saw that man again. But one thing was for sure, I really thought I was gonna die that day. Around Christmas this time of year, I moved into a new house that was built back in the 1940s if I remember correctly. It's an old home that, like any other, makes a bunch of strange noises at night. I'm not normally one who gets scared easily, so staying here alone wasn't going to bother me. Luckily, for the first two weeks of living here, I had two friends rooming with me as they looked for an apartment. They had just moved to the city, and I allowed them to stay here while they found another place to live. 
My friends finally found an apartment the second week after we moved into the house, and moved out that weekend while I was at work. I had specifically mentioned to one of them who had the front door key to leave it on the counter when they left so I could get it back from them. When I returned home from work, I found that the key wasn't there, as they'd forgotten to leave it when they officially moved out. It wasn't a problem, and I wasn't concerned as I had the back door to get in and out of the house, and my friend promised to get it back to me the next day. Fast forward to the next evening, and I decided to watch a couple movies while kicking back and enjoying my official first night at home alone in the new house. I waited for my friend to come by and drop off the key for a while while I watched movies, but she didn't stop by. After texting her, she said that her boyfriend, the other friend, roommate, had to stay later at work, and since he had a car, she couldn't drop the key off that night and promised to bring it by first thing in the morning before she went to work at a coffee shop down the street at 5 a.m. After finishing up my last movie for the night, I went to bed and ended up having a rather vivid and frightening nightmare. Before I describe to you the nightmare that I had, I've made a quick diagram of what the layout of my dream bedroom looked like, which you can see here on the screen. So in my dream, I was laying on the bed with a friend. It was very dark in my bedroom, but there was a light source coming from somewhere and I was able to see where everything was. I heard the sound of clothes falling on the floor, so I sat up and looked down the hall where the bathroom was. Clothes were piled up on the floor of the bathroom door. I remember being perplexed as to why and how these were here, and I thought that they had fallen or were thrown from the closet. That's when I heard my friend say, I'm scared. Me too, I replied. We decided to get up and move to another part of the house, away from the bedroom. On our way out, I looked down the hall, and some thing peeked around the corner of the hall from out of the closet. It was some shadowy figure, and I could tell that it was bald, and my brain made me assume that it was wearing a suit. And no, it's not a Slenderman if that's what you're thinking. What really freaked me out was that this thing moved so unnaturally human. It moved in a really jerky fashion, twitching or glitching, and it really scared me. Get out, I screamed. Leave. You don't belong here. And the more I yelled at it, the more it jerked back and forth, as if it were stuck between a doorway of the closet. I ran towards the thing while screaming at it, and right when I reached it, it slipped back into the closet. I immediately ran into the closet and flipped on the switch, only to find nothing there. That's when I woke up. I was so shaken by the nightmare that I was too afraid to open my eyes and fear that I would see something standing next to my bed if I did. I attempted to fall back asleep, but it was so quiet in the house and I was pretty disturbed by my dream that I decided to turn the TV on and drown out the silence and take my mind off the nightmare. I remember checking my phone and seeing that it was about 4 a.m. After watching about 15 to 20 minutes of television, I became sleepy and decided to try and fall back asleep. I turned off the TV and prepared to fall asleep. About 10 minutes passed when I heard knocking come from somewhere in the house. I know I heard it because my cat, who usually sleeps with me on my bed, perked up and was staring outside of my bedroom door. She quickly jumped off the bed to go investigate, and I ignored the knocking sound because I had assumed that it was my friend dropping off the key. Since it was almost 5 a.m., and that's when she said she would come by, I finally fell asleep. The next morning I woke up, and the first thing I did was check the mailbox for the key. It wasn't there. I was a bit frustrated and decided to go to my friend's work to grab the key from her. I was told that she wasn't in that day. I gave her a call, which went straight to voicemail, and shortly after I left a message. I received a text from her claiming that she had woken up at 6 a.m. with an upset stomach and had called into work, and that I should just stop by to pick up the key. Apart from the complications of getting the key, I thought about the nightmare I had earlier that morning and the knocking I heard shortly after when I'd woken up from the dream. I found it odd that even if my friend did stop by to drop off the key, she would knock on the door. It would have been as if she assumed that I would be awake to greet her or that I would wake up in order to greet her and get the key. The more I thought about the knocking, the more I remember specifically not sounding like a knocking on the door, but more like a tapping on glass. We have a glass sliding door in the kitchen that I used a while while my friend had the front door key, and the sliding door leads into a fenced off backyard. I started to think about why someone would even be in my backyard between 4.30 at 5 in the morning, or why they would even tap on the glass in the first place. It didn't make very much sense. I shrugged it off and decided to go about my day, starting off with watering my plants in the kitchen that sit on the countertop that's below three small kitchen windows. I opened the blinds to let in more sunlight, and what I saw scared the absolute fuck out of me. The photo you're about to see is what I saw when I opened my blinds. You have the decision to believe me or not, 
but I can swear on my life and the life of everyone that I know that I did not do this, and that was not there the day before. It was a bizarre string of events that led up to seeing this, which is why it freaked me out. I don't know what was outside of my window early that morning, but someone, or something, was. At the time of this story, I was a 23-year-old woman living in Charleston, South Carolina. I know the way I phrase that makes it sound like I'm not a woman anymore. I am, but anyway, this is my story. I worked as a paralegal at one of the small law firms in town, and five days a week during my lunch hour, I'd head off to the same Starbucks near my workplace to grab a coffee. My job was actually pretty repetitive, and so was my lunchtime routine. Most people's are, I suppose. That's why I'd always see the same faces in the coffee shop, day in and day out. It was like a little microcosm. The same baristas were always there, too. There was this one guy who worked there every weekday. According to his tag, his name was Randall. He was about six foot tall, average build, had very short ginger hair, a crew cut I guess you'd call it. No Prince Charming, but not entirely unattractive either. Just a guy who kind of blended in. You know how at Starbucks they ask for your name to write on the cups? Well, the first few times Randall took my order, he asked me for mine. Stephanie, I'd say. He saw me so frequently that I guess he just committed my name to memory after that. Every day I'd approach the counter, and every day Randall would take my order. No name required. He'd just jot it down on the cup without asking. After a couple of weeks of this, however, Randall started flirting with me, I suppose. Not verbally, but through his writing on the cup. He started drawing little hearts over the eye in my name, and sometimes even drew some after my name as well. Bear in mind, I'd never actually spoken to this guy. Well, other than giving him my order. No friendly chit-chat or anything. I mean, I was flattered and all, but I wasn't interested. The strange part is every time I went in there, he'd never tried to talk to me more than just taking my order, and never addressed the fact that he was adding these flirty touches to his writing. In fact, he never showed any kind of emotion on his face whatsoever. No smiles, no eyebrow movement, kind of a robotic guy. You'd have thought this was his build-up to asking me out or something. But nope. He just acted professional at the counter, and never said anything apart from, what would you like, and that'll be X dollars fifty. Despite that, he kept on adding the little hearts every time he wrote my name down. And over time, he even started adding little kisses after my name. It made things a little uncomfortable for me, but maybe he was just a little odd in the head, and did this to regular customers too. I just accepted it and ignored it. That is, until the day he added his phone number to the cup, along with a little winky face drawn next to it, with a speech bubble saying, Call me. I immediately went back to Randall at the counter, and quietly and politely turned him down, letting him know that I was flattered, but that now wasn't really a good time for me. Just a little white lie. Like always, his face remained neutral. No emotional response at all. He simply said, Okay and averted his eyes. It was very awkward. I usually take my coffee to go, but that particular day, I really speed-walked out of there. From then on, I considered going somewhere else for my coffee, but to be honest, I really liked what I got from Starbucks, and the only other one nearby was an extra ten-minute walk away. I figured we were both adults, and the situation didn't need to be awkward, so I kept going back there. Randall remained stony-faced as always. Luckily, the love hearts on the coffee cup stopped after that, and things went back to being normal. Time passed, and one weekend, I agreed to go on a lunch date with another guy I met. We both had super busy schedules, but worked near each other, and had the same time slots for lunch, so it made sense for us to have a mini one-hour coffee and conversation. We agreed that the Starbucks would be a nice, casual spot. I forgot to consider the whole Randall situation entirely. I got there, and the guy I'm meeting's already found a table. I go over and give him a hug. He asks me what I'd like to drink, and, like a gentleman, goes up to the counter to order. I sit, waiting at the table. When he comes back with the coffees, my date says to me, Damn, the guy who took my order has a real attitude problem. 
I turn to see who he's talking about. Standing by the register, glaring at the both of us, was Randall. He had a look of intense anger on his face, like a person who's just been betrayed. This was the only time I'd ever seen any kind of emotion from the guy at all. Yeah, he didn't even ask me what I wanted, just stared at me angrily and snatched the money right out of my hand. Some people, huh? Annoyingly, we couldn't take our coffees to go, as they came in mugs and not takeout cups. We just sat there, trying to have a normal date. All the while, Randall continued to glare at us from the counter, only looking away briefly when someone came up to order. After the most awkward date of my life thanks to Randall, the two of us got up, said that we'd be in contact, and went back to our respective workplaces. I'd like to say that Randall was just an awkward and harmless guy. I'd like to say that this is where the story ends, but on both counts, I'd be lying. That same night, I was sat alone in my apartment watching TV, thinking about work, my awkward date, the bills I had to pay, and life in general. All of a sudden, there's a frantic knocking on my front door. I got up and peered through the peephole. On the other side was Randall. Is he in there with you? What the hell? What was he doing here? Better question, how did he know where I lived? I know you're in there. I know he's there too. Well, answer me. I was terrified and confused. Randall, what on earth are you talking about? Go away! The door handle rattled as he tested it from the other side. Luckily, I'd locked the thing when I got home. Then, slam, he threw the full weight of his body against my door. The damn psycho was trying to break in. Another slam, and then another. My door bounced with every thud against it. From there, autopilot took over me. I grabbed a knife from my kitchen area and ran into the bathroom at the other end of my apartment. I locked myself in there and called the cops. From all the noise he was making, I'm sure a few of my neighbors did too. None of them came out to stop him though, and I can't say I blame them. Randall was slamming on my front door for a good ten minutes before it gave way. Luckily it was quite sturdy, and he was no superstar athlete. I could hear him in my apartment though, and I tried to muffle my fear as I hid in my locked bathroom. Thankfully, the police arrived shortly after he broke in. I could hear them telling him to freeze. But when my heart really sank, when it really hit the floor, was when I heard one of the officers shout something I didn't expect to hear. Drop the weapon. As it turns out, Randall had come with a gun in his hand. Before coming to my place, he'd broken into another house in a different part of Charleston. Namely, the house of my date from earlier. He'd smashed a window, crawled inside, and trashed the place. Didn't take anything, but he didn't go there to steal. Luckily, my date wasn't home that night. He was out with his buddies. Randall then came to my place, thinking that was where my date was. He figured we were an item. Turns out Randall had been stalking me for months, always keeping his distance, watching from the shadows. He'd become obsessed. Because I lived such a routine existence and I was so predictable, it was easy for him to track me. He followed me on his time off, and, by his own admission, would stand outside my apartment complex at night, looking up at my window, thinking about coming up to surprise me. Before that night, he decided that would be too creepy. At least he had some sense, I guess. Randall got time. Five years for his threatening behavior. Not long enough in my book but at least I won't be seeing him at Starbucks anymore. I also got a restraining order for when he gets out, and switched firms and apartments to keep him from finding me. Still, what if my date had been home that night? What if the police didn't arrive as quickly as they did? I'm not sure I want to know the answers to those questions. He never actually hurt anyone, and the prosecutors couldn't prove that he had evil intent, so I can kind of understand why the judge gave him such a short sentence. But I know in my heart that he came to kill. Now all I want is to never see Randall again. I noticed my neighbors have a really nice pool. It goes from three to eight feet deep, and it's enclosed and private. 
I can only see it from my master bedroom window. Wow, I thought, staring down at the massive pool as my neighbors splashed around playing Marco Polo. Must be nice to afford that luxury. I met my neighbors the day after I moved in, as I was walking around the neighborhood to get a feel of my surroundings. They invited me into their home, and they seemed like nice folks, maybe a little reserved. Jim, the husband, was in his mid-forties and seemed to be a bit of a working man. He was wearing work jeans with white and red paint dried up on the front and a grey t-shirt. He talked about his building projects around the house and other, well, considerably boring things. His wife, Tessa, also in her forties, was a sweet lady. She seemed genuinely interested in what her husband was talking about. I smiled and responded, but I honestly couldn't wait to get out of there. I let them know I had to get going and went on my way. They made me a little uneasy with how self-involved they all were. Over the past couple weeks, I noticed they had a few children over there too. Two daughters, aged 6 to 14 maybe, and a 5-year-old son. They would splash around in the pool for hours each day. This didn't really bother me. I sometimes would peer out my window to see them out there having a grand old time in the water, while Jim and Tessa cooked on the grill. I guess they even had a maid that would help out around the house, but would also join them for their cookouts and summertime activities. I would peek out there just to see how much fun the family would be having. One evening, however, I wish I didn't look this time. I had been cleaning up the trash along my backyard fence, nothing but my back porch light piercing through the darkness of the night, when I heard a splash coming from Jim and Tessa's pool. Now, this wouldn't have been surprising had it not been pitch dark and after nine o'clock at night. I froze in place, eyes glaring at my fence, intently listening for another sound. I couldn't see anything through the cracks in my fence but I could hear more loud splashes every couple of moments. It almost sounded like heavy objects being thrown into the water. I closed my trash can lids and ran upstairs to my room so I could take a look from a better angle, out from my bedroom window. After adjusting my eyes a little bit, I was finally able to make out what the splashing sounds were. Jim was outside, along with Tessa and their oldest daughter and they were tossing trash bags into their pool. I was obviously confused by this peculiar activity. I mean, who puts their trash in their pool? They swim in there every day. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that there was some strange red substance pouring out from under one of the bags as well. It swirled up ominously around the plastic, through the water, almost like blood. My mind and heart refused to believe it could be blood, though. They must be teaching their child some kind of science experiment with food coloring, right? I continued watching as the three of them descended into their pool from the steps. They were fully clothed and smiling eerily as they made their way towards the red food coloring. Jim reached out and grabbed one of the trash bags and gestured to Tessa to grab another one. What the hell? My heart began racing now. I wasn't sure why, but I was getting more and more uneasy as I observed their peculiar night swim from my bedroom window. Suddenly, Jim tore into the trash bag he had grabbed and dumped the contents into the pool in front of him. My eyes grew wide with terror as two bloody, mutilated legs and a torso hit the water, more red pouring into the pool. That's not food coloring, I said to myself in my mind, as if I wasn't already thinking it deep down before. Tessa followed, dumping more limbs into the water. The pool was beginning to look like red fruit juice at this point. My stomach was churning now. I could feel puke brewing in my gut as I viewed my neighbors basically bathing in the blood of these body parts. They were diving down and coming back up, throwing their heads back as they rose up from the water, running the blood through their hair. They were even splashing each other and laughing. Did they kill somebody? Was I really living next to some psychopaths who bathe in their victim's blood? I know what you're thinking. Didn't I call the cops? Yes, I did. 
don't worry. They have been taken away. The horrific scene quarantined off. I was able to get some info from what was going on behind closed doors. Apparently, human limbs were hidden throughout the residence. Normal, everyday objects were remodeled with human skin and extremities. The children even had dolls with real, bloody human hair and human ears glued onto them. The fridge was stocked with meals made from body parts, ready to serve. The worst thing of all, the victims were all mostly related to these people. They killed family and friends, consumed them, and bathed in their blood. What kind of evil went on here? Was there some sort of dark religious motive? I'm not sure if I'll ever know. I never got any backstory on what exactly was going on in that house, nor did I do any extra research. I didn't really want to know too much, not while I was actually still getting good sleep at night. New neighbors are moving into the house today. Their U-Haul pulled up moments ago. A young couple stepped out with their two young children, a son and a daughter. I wonder if they know the story behind their new home. Do you think they still would have bought the place, knowing there were dismembered bodies throughout the residence? What if these new neighbors have the same taste in home decor, or the same affinity for night swimming? My friend John recently convinced me to share this story that happened to us near McCall, Idaho. We'd like to hear what you all make of it, cause it sure beats the hell out of us. John's parents owned a lakeside cabin, and we had decided to spend the weekend there with our other friend Tom. We just planned on kicking back with a few beers, going out and enjoying nature. This place was quite a ways out of town, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Not another living person around for miles in any direction. We shared some laughs on our journey there, talking about all the things we were going to get up to. The place was a small but stunning log cabin, overlooking this picturesque little lake. We spent what was left of the daylight unpacking, cracking open cold ones, and swimming in that lake. We dived off the wooden dock into the water, cannonballing each other and just generally having a fun time. Night time rolled around, and the three of us were playing cards inside the living room area of the cabin. It was a nice, peaceful evening, and we were starting to wind down after the long day. Now, it was a relatively quiet night. But at around 11pm, things became real silent. Any rustling outside had stopped, along with the sound of the breeze and the hooting of birds. Out of nowhere, this eerie silence just filled the air. There was nothing suggesting danger, but we all looked at each other, like we all felt something strange in the atmosphere. It's hard to explain, but for a few seconds... The nothingness felt like something, something horrible. That's when this loud splash broke the silence. It sounded like something huge had just fallen from a great height into the lake. We rushed outside to see what it was. That's the curious part. The water was completely still, no ripples whatsoever. But there was something there. Something large, floating in the lake. We got nearer to the water's edge to take a closer look. We could make it out now. It wasn't a thing. It was a person. A body, floating face down in the water, arms outstretched. It looked like a man, and it seemed as if we were too late to help. The body was bloated, like a waterlogged corpse. Where the hell had he come from? Nobody else was meant to be around anywhere nearby. We all started freaking out, and John ran down to the wooden dock's walkway to try and pull the guy out. I fumbled for my phone to call for an ambulance. Tom looked on in horror as John got to the end of the walkway and kneeled down to grab the body as it floated by the dock. As I was on the phone, I heard John shriek. Something had spooked him real bad. 
Tom ran to his aid, but Zhang came rushing back to intercept him, pale as a ghost. Guys, there's nothing we can do for him. He's gone. Come on, let's get back inside. Upon hearing this, Tom looked concerned. Dude, he said, we can't just leave him there. We have to get him out. Tom started moving towards the body. No, Tom, said John. Not you. Come on, back inside, now. John's tone was so serious. I hadn't heard him speak like that in the longest time. It kind of frightened me, to be honest. And it definitely convinced Tom, who turned back and hurried inside the cabin. We all waited in the living area for the ambulance to arrive, looking outside every now and then to see the body still floating face down in the water. The old red and blue lights took a long time to get to us, but as soon as they pulled up, we rushed out to greet them. We told them about the body in the lake and went to point it out to them. But that's the thing. It wasn't there. The corpse was nowhere to be seen. Where the hell had it gone? Had it sunk? Divers searched the small lake and found no trace of a body whatsoever. The water was empty. There were absolutely no tire tracks near the cabin. Nothing unusual or out of place. Nowhere for anyone to go. Where the hell had the corpse gone? The man had been face down in the water for ages. He wasn't exactly in any condition to just stand up and walk away. If this was some guy just messing with us, we had no idea how or why. This whole experience shook me up pretty bad, but I honestly wouldn't be sharing this story if it wasn't for what John told me. Remember that John shrieked? Well, he hadn't told us what scared him so much that night because he didn't want to freak Tom out. But, in private, John confessed to me what had happened. He said that as he leant down to examine the body, the corpse's head turned up to look at him. Its hand grabbed his arm. Its face was charred, its eyes milky white. It looked at me, bro, said John. It looked at me, and it said, why you, not Tom? John told me this with complete sincerity, and I for one believe him. We've never been back to that cabin since, and I think we'll keep it that way. The Solano case happened all the way back in 2006. Uncle Carlos had been working as a freelance investigator for a good long while by that point, and had built up a reputation for himself. Word of mouth led a new client to his office, a woman called Maria Solano. Expecting this to be another cheating husband type gig, my uncle sat her down and asked her to tell him the nature of the case. What she said couldn't have been further from what he expected. Mrs. Solano's son had gotten involved with a gang of thugs in the area. It worried her and her husband, because their son wasn't anything like these guys. He was a smart kid, did well at school, and was hoping to go to university. They were far from a bad family. For whatever reason, he had started going to the gang's clubhouse every night. Soon, that became every day and night. It got to the point where the Solanos hadn't seen their son for three days straight. Fearing for their son's safety, Mrs. Solano's husband went to confront the gang on their own turf. Mrs. Solano sat for hours at home, waiting for her husband to return. He never did. The police did little to help her. They seemed unwilling to do much at all. Every time they made a half-assed effort to find the woman's husband and son, they'd come up with nothing. This confused and infuriated her. It was obvious who was behind both of their disappearances, the gang of thugs. Were the police unable to do their job or just unwilling? She continued to hound the cops, demanding that they investigate. Some time passed, and Mrs. Salano received a phone call. It wasn't from the cops, though. On the other end of the line, 
A deep male voice told her to stay out of the gang's business, to stop searching for her missing family members. Said that if she valued her life, she had cut her losses and move on. According to Mrs. Solano, the voice sounded a strange mixture of threatening and concerned. It also sounded vaguely familiar to her. She couldn't quite place who it was exactly, but she felt as if it was someone she had talked to before. Someone who worked in a local store, perhaps. She decided not to heed the caller's advice. Since the police refused to be of help, she started doing her own detective work. She went sniffing around the gang's headquarters. Unfortunately for her, this didn't go unnoticed. That very same afternoon, she received a letter while she was home alone. Inside it was a severed human ear. A note attached read, We told you to stay away. Out of desperation, Mrs. Solano came to my uncle for help. The only things she could give him to help were pictures of her missing loved ones and directions to the gang's hideout. My uncle took the job. The first thing he did was call up some of his old buddies in the force and ask them what they had found out. The cops gave him nothing and warned him to drop the case for his own sake. Jesus, what the hell was going on? Not having anything else to go on, Uncle Carlos decided to drive to the gang's hideout at night and do some sleuthing of his own. He followed Solano's directions. Turns out, this place was remote. Real remote. A medium-sized shack out in the middle of nowhere, completely secluded. Getting close to it wouldn't be an option. It'd be too obvious. Instead, he parked up on a vantage point overlooking the shack and used a pair of binoculars to keep an eye on things. It was a particularly dark night, so as long as he kept his lights off, he was effectively invisible. Now usually, surveillance work is long and boring, but knowing what was at stake with this case, my uncle was fully engaged and focused. Over the course of several hours, he saw numerous gang members entering the shack. In spite of that, there was no sign of Mr. Salano or the sun. As the night went on, things became extremely disturbing. In the early a.m., about 15 or so gang members exited the shack, all of them naked and covered in white paint. They had built a large fire outside, which they were now circling. Then they stood there, contorting their body into strange, unnatural shapes. One of them led a dog out to the fire from the shack and proceeded to slit the poor creature's throat. As it died, they were all screaming chanting, making inhuman sounds. All of this was so loud that my uncle could hear them clearly from his vantage point. This wasn't a gang. It was a cult. This was some fucking weird sacrifice. These guys were nutjobs, a bunch of fanatical freaks living out in the sticks, most likely off their heads on drugs. Why on earth were the cops ignoring these guys? fearing his cover might get blown, and honestly really freaked out by what he had just witnessed, my uncle made a quick getaway. The more he looked into the group, the more he realized their cultish tendencies. It became obvious to my uncle that the police were either terrified of these guys, or were in their pockets. Potentially, a few of them could have even been members. He doesn't know. The reason he doesn't know is because he was forced to drop the case. You see, Mrs. Salano went missing. Just like before, the police did little to look for her. To this day, nobody has found a body or anything. No information about her or her family's disappearance exists online. Nothing. It's like they never existed. For whatever reason, the Salanos became ghosts. After the woman's sudden disappearance, Uncle Carlos himself started receiving threatening calls, telling him to stay out of the group's business. His cover had somehow been blown. 
They said that if he continued his investigation, then he'd end up like the others, and his wife and daughters would be sold into sex slavery. Since my uncle had nothing left to gain and everything to lose, he did what they wanted and dropped the case. They had already proven themselves to be people of their words, after all. It's bothered him ever since, but there really wasn't much else he could do. His clients were most likely dead. The cops were either bribed, scared, or in on the whole thing. It was all totally messed up. As for the family's son, well, either he's dead too, or was brainwashed by the group, and is still a member. Whatever the case, there was nothing Uncle Carlos could do about it. The risk of trying to expose the group was just too high. In the end, real life isn't like those detective shows and movies. The bad guys don't always get caught, and life just goes on. It makes me wonder how many other disappearances those bastards have been responsible for over the years. I don't know if you've heard of Missing 411. It's a series of books about people who have disappeared in the wilds of North America. Not typical missing person cases, though. Obviously, people go missing for all sorts of reasons. They get lost, maybe even attacked by an animal. Heck, a lot of the time, they want to go missing. No, these books deal with the unusual cases, the ones that nobody can seem to explain. The only reason I bring them up is because I'm a private investigator. I found out about these books after working on one particularly strange case, and now... I'm certain that something strange is going on, and that people are trying to cover it up. I had been hired by a family to look into the disappearance of their son, a young man we'll call Chad for the sake of anonymity. Chad had gone missing in Yosemite National Park a year prior. The police got nowhere with the case, and the park rangers were being decidedly uncooperative. I'd worked on missing person cases before and was confident that I could at minimum find some leads. We agreed on a price, and they told me everything they could about the moments leading up to their son's disappearance. On the day in question, Chad had gone out hiking with his friend. Now, these boys were outdoorsmen, went camping all the time, hiked all over America, were used to spending time in the great outdoors. What I'm trying to get at here is that these guys knew what they were doing, when the boys didn't come home that day, a search team was sent out to look for them. All that was found of them were their boots. Two pairs of empty boots, standing ominously in a clearing, their owners nowhere to be found. No bodies, no blood, no footprints. Police dogs couldn't pick up any scent. Apparently, the animals got confused and started walking in circles. Now, these types of cases are usually pretty cut and dry. Most likely, they would have succumbed to some sort of injury, accidentally fell from a great height or something. But the whole area had been searched thoroughly. There was no trace of them. Bear excrement in the area had been collected and analysed. Nothing. Like Chad's parents had warned me, the park rangers were of little to no help at all when I tried to talk to them. They were evasive, hostile even. That was odd. I'd dealt with the Yosemite Rangers before, and they'd always been happy to assist me. There was a strange lack of evidence for a case that had been open for so long. It honestly left me stumped and unsure of how to approach things. That's when I came across the missing 411 books. The author of these books has researched over 2,000 missing person cases that all share similar, mysterious characteristics. They all seem to happen in clusters around national parks. The few who are found alive tend to have memory loss, and those whose bodies are found died in indeterminable ways. The majority remain missing. When they are found, however, it tends to be in places that are seemingly impossible to get to by foot, or in places that had previously been explored thoroughly. 
In one such case, the body of a young boy was found laying perfectly out on a tree stump, many days after he had first disappeared, in an area which had been searched many, many times. Many of these people vanish in the presence of family and friends. One moment, they're right there. The next, they're gone. Much like with Chad and his friend, the police dogs in these cases never seem to be able to track a scent, and their handlers note how weird the creatures start acting. Experienced outdoors people vanishing off the face of the earth. Experienced hunters whose guns are found next to all their equipment. The weapons are never fired. The majority of them are similar age to the missing boys. Nobody knows exactly how many have vanished, but it's what's quickly becoming known as the nation's silent mass disaster. In the end, I couldn't give Chad's parents any answers. This was an impossible nut to crack. No matter how you look at it, things don't seem to stack up. Then... When you hear about all of the other similar cases in Missing 411, things start to make even less sense. All around this great country of ours, someone, or something, is taking our people. Some weird shit is going on in the woods, man, and I don't know how to explain it. <laughs>